Hey, Jace with Popcorn Recap here. Today we'll be discussing a science fiction film called Predestination. Just a fair warning, there are spoilers ahead, and this one is a mindfuck. At the beginning of the movie, the narrator asks, If the guy who ruined our life was put right in front of us, would we kill him? An agent goes into the basement of a building where a bomb is ticking. As he's trying to disarm the bomb, someone nearby distracts him. He tries to put the bomb in a special suitcase, but it explodes in his face. The agent is burned by the explosion. Then he gets handed a violin case. Then all of a sudden he's in a hospital, and his whole body is in bandages. Next we see newspaper clippings of someone called the Fizzle Bomber, who killed many people in different cities. In March 1975, 11,000 people died. The agent has his bandages finally removed, and the doctor tells him that they reconstructed his face so he won't be able to recognize himself. He also tells the agent that his vocal cords were damaged from the explosion. His chart shows that he has mood swings, psychosis, and bouts of depression. As the agent prepares for his next mission, we see him doing voice recordings for someone to listen to in seven years. Someone walks into a bar and our agent is acting as a barkeep. The barkeep's name is never really known, so we'll just call him Barkeep. They briefly talk about the fears of the Fizzle Bomber's fifth attack. Then the mysterious man asks the barkeep for a joke. The barkeep says, What came first, the chicken or the egg? The man replies, The rooster. The man says he's a writer for a confession magazine. The mysterious man starts to talk about his backstory to the barkeep. We find out the man was born a girl. On September 14, 1945, she was left on the doorstep of an orphanage. A woman at the orphanage named her Jane. As Jane grows up in the orphanage, we see that she is very inquisitive and very different from the other children. Jane knew right away that she was always different. She always dreamed of having parents and made a vow that her future child would have a mom and a dad. She learned early on how to fight her bullies. She was even smarter than all the kids in her class, especially in math and science, but she hated how she looked. As a young woman, she was recruited by a man, Mr. Robertson, to work for a company called Space Corp. We see women being trained to test out their motion sickness, their endurance, and everything else. Jane excelled. After a brawl, a doctor performed a detailed physical examination and found something that would disqualify her. Mr. Robertson tells her that she's being let go because of the fight, but he would try everything to get her reinstated. After leaving Space Corps, Jane worked odd jobs helping families. Then she took night classes. She unexpectedly meets a man after class. She quotes Abraham Lincoln, and the man finishes the quote for her. She fell in love pretty quickly, but one night, the guy just up and leaves her. Mr. Robertson visits Jane and tells her pretty much that Space Corps doesn't really deal with space. It's more than that. He was mysterious about it, but was adamant on recruiting her. Unfortunately, Jane was now pregnant. After she gives birth, the doctor visits her and tells her she had a girl. The doctor then tells her that she had complications during the C-section. It's revealed that Jane had both genitalia. She's intersex. Due to excessive bleeding, the doctor was forced to perform a hysterectomy. He had to remove her uterus. So they reconstructed her to have just male genitalia. Jane is distraught about how they performed this without her consent. Jane decides to name her child Jane, since she realizes that she would have to change her own name after her transition into a man anyway. After two weeks, someone snatched baby Jane in the hospital nursery. The barkeep asks if they know who it was. The man responds that it was a man with a face shaped like yours or mine. She filed a missing persons report, checked adoption agencies and orphanages, but never found baby Jane. She didn't have much time to grieve her loss, since Jane was now going through her full transition into a man. She had three surgeries and started taking testosterone. Her voice never got deep enough, so she started training to talk like a man. As he undresses, we see his post-surgical scars. He's now a man. He says that every time he looks at himself, he sees the man that ruined his life. He tells the barkeep he knows what women want to hear. And just this morning, he found out that he's no longer shooting blanks and is fully fertile. He begins to talk about how he has struggled with being a man, how difficult it is and wants the doctor that did this to him to die. He enlists in Space Corps again. The doctor at Space Corps inspects his body, and he was deemed unfit to join. With what life has given him so far, he seems defeated and bitter. He says that bitterness can take over. The barkeep says it's easier to hate than love. In the next scene, we see John, who was once Jane, 
trying to start a new life in New York, he becomes a writer. The barkeep asks John, what if I can put him in front of you, the one who ruined your life? Would you kill him? John replies, in a heartbeat. The barkeep admits to John that he's part of Robertson's secret Space Corps society. John is a bit hesitant to follow. The barkeep jokes and says, you think I'm the fizzle bomber? What if you're the fizzle bomber? As they both walk down the stairs, the barkeep starts singing, I'm my own grandpa. The barkeep brings over a violin case and tells John it's basically a time traveling machine. In just seconds, they teleport to Cleveland, Ohio, April 3rd, 1963. John and the barkeep feel sick due to the time distortion field. The barkeep explains that he works for the Temporal Bureau, the agency that Mr. Robertson works for. They prevent crimes before they take place, similar to the movie Minority Report. He explains the rules of time traveling that the Bureau allows. They can't distort the timeline too much, otherwise they themselves would cease to exist. The barkeep says he suspects the man who met Jane could be the fizzle bomber, and he must be killed. John asks if he has a choice, because some things are just inevitable. The barkeep admits that the life is lonely. He has no family, but he does have a purpose. Jane leaves class while John waits for the fizzle bomber. When Jane bumps into John, Jane says the Abraham Lincoln quote, and John finishes it for her. At this moment, we realize that John is the man whom Jane fell in love with. Jane fell in love with her future self. John tells Jane that she's beautiful and wishes that someone had told her that. We see the barkeep watching from a distance. It seems like forcing John to this timeline is essential to his mission to stop the fizzle bomber. The barkeep travels to March 1970 to stop the fizzle bomber again. We see the fizzle bomber setting up the bomb and the barkeep starts a shootout. The fizzle bomber disarms the barkeep and knocks him unconscious. The barkeep gets up and then sees himself getting burned. The sequence we saw at the beginning of the film. The barkeep pushes the violin case toward the burning victim, and the burned victim travels to 1992. The barkeep travels to 1964. He's in a rundown apartment. He's disoriented since he kept jumping through time. He records himself talking through a tape recorder. We switch over to John and Jane on a date. Since John already knows Jane so well, he's able to challenge her and impress Jane fairly quick. Mr. Robertson time jumps and meets up with the barkeep. The barkeep gives Robertson a chipset from the bomb. Robertson says he's making too many jumps at once. It can affect his mental stability if he does it too often. He also notes that he should not be making illegal time jumps that the Bureau didn't approve of. But Robertson implies that they can accomplish so much more if they didn't follow the rules. The barkeep feels bad that John is now involved, and Robertson says it's important to have someone outside the agency to do this job and that he should understand. It's always more beneficial to have someone who has no ancestry, no background, no ties with anyone. Robertson says he's vital in all this so he can lay seeds for the future, then leaves. We see the barkeep looking over a baby and realize it was him who snatched Jane's child. He caused Jane all the emotional distress from losing her child. He grabs the violin case and sets it to 1945. This is where we see baby Jane dropped off at the orphanage, so essentially, Jane slept with her boy self, John, and gave birth to herself. The barkeep travels back to 1963, where he calls John over, interrupting his time with Jane. John threatens him with a gun, angry that he was deceived. The barkeep says this was all predestined. Everything was meant to happen, and now it's time to go. They travel to 1985, where barkeep tells John that his life is important in this mission to save thousands of lives. Robertson says each person had a part in the future. John and the barkeep have all been essential. He says the organization wouldn't have thrived without the fizzle bomber. He hands the barkeep an envelope. This is where the barkeep retires and then leaves John all his recordings. The barkeep goes to the bar one last time. I am my own grandpa plays on the jukebox. He travels to 1975 New York three months before the bomb that killed 11,000 people. This is where he retires and tries to decommission the time-traveling device, but it fails. He opens the envelope. It says to trace the purchase order of the chipset from the bomb. We see John back in 1985 starting his mission. He's given a violin case. Then the barkeep goes to an antique shop and buys a typewriter. He says he used to be a writer and is taking it up again. He says he used to write confession stories for a magazine. Then the barkeep types up Jane and then John Doe on his manuscript. 
we are hit with flashbacks of the doctor, then Mr. Robertson saying the effects of psychosis can be serious, how time travel can be disorienting. Using all the clues he received, he figures the fizzle bomber is at a laundromat. He goes to the laundromat to arrest him, but realizes the fizzle bomber is him. The fizzle bomber explains that he prevented many deaths and proves it by showing newspaper clippings, but it still doesn't justify all the civilians that are killed in the crossfire. The fizzle bomber was able to use the failed decommissioned time traveling device to continue traveling through time. He tells the barkeep that they created each other. It's predestined. There's nothing they can do. The barkeep says he will never become the fizzle bomber. The fizzle bomber tells him Robertson was the one who set it all up. The fizzle bomber says in order to break the time loop, the barkeep must not kill him. He has to learn to love him to break the loop. The barkeep refuses and shoots the fizzle bomber multiple times. We now see John listening to the recordings that the barkeep left. Eventually, we see the barkeep stand up, and we see the same scars that John had with his transition surgery. The barkeep is John and Jane. He is an Ouroboros snake. He is one person traveling through time, recreating himself. What a mindfuck of a movie. Really gives a new meaning to fucking yourself. The more I think about the movie, the more I find it difficult to explain. The barkeep is the fizzle bomber. Jane is John, and they had sex to create baby Jane. They're all one person, but the difficulty is explaining how this is even possible, because how did baby Jane exist in the first place if adult Jane and John had to exist? We go back to that question, what came first? The chicken or the egg? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.